From the studios in beautiful Oceanport, New Jersey, welcome to the biggest and greatest podcast ever. I'm your host, Ray Kay. Hey guys, uh, we have a treat for you today. This is this is a special situation. Uh, it's a treat, actually, if you like to learn and you like to have fun, then, then it's a big treat. Chris Meyer, CEO of Nerve LLC, an innovation advisory firm, check this mission out, to anticipate and shape the future of business. Chris is a best-selling author of four books. I'll, g- I'll give the quick rundown. I could probably go for a half hour, but he's written in New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Business Week. He's a he's consulting magazine, uh, consulting magazine ranked Chris amongst the 20 most influential consultants in the U.S. Whoa. So it is my sincere pleasure to welcome to this podcast, Mr. Chris Meyer. Welcome, Chris. Hey, Ray. Good to be with you. All right. Good, good. I will uh, get right into this. We're going to talk about a few things. Uh, one, Chris, let's talk about we were talking the other day. I like to, you know, capture about four items here. You know, is first let's let's tackle. Let me see the your your the transition from corporate world to you know you call it a portfolio career. Can you talk about that? Because in, in this time and age, this seems to be kind of where everything's going right now. Yeah. Well, um, and maybe it'll help me explain the, the somewhat pretentious mission to anticipate and shape the future of business. Um, I. Uh, I did, you know, garden variety strategic management consulting, general management consulting for about 20 years. And um, what happened was that I started focusing on the, uh, the information technology industry. And in 1984, was really early in creating a group that believed in digital convergence. So, you know, um, back then, telephones, hardware, software, information services, those were all separate industries. Mm-hmm. And we were really early in seeing that there was going to be one digital industry. Now, do you have this natural gift, Chris, that you always had when you were kind of young? Or is it something you have to, I guess you have to work at everything, but is this sort of a natural thing you have to kind of foresee the future? Um, I guess, yeah, I guess I'm, here's what I'll, I'd say. Is it a I, gift, I, you know? It's uh, the gift is not believing that everything has to stay the same. This this will strike you as really strange, but um, in uh, one one, <laughs> one night I got up out of bed. This was in high school, and I wrote down on a piece of paper: "For all x dx dt is greater than zero." What the hell does that mean? That means no matter what it is, it's changing over time, because most people tend to think that the world is the way it is and it's going to stay that way. And it just, that never made sense to me. So um, I guess, as I say, I think the, the gift is not not uh, disbelieving that the world can change. Then you see something and you say, well, what's the consequence of that? You know, if you, um, uh, I remember, for example, this is the 90s and you first started downloading upgrades to your Apple uh, operating system. And if you had a general sense that computing was getting to be a big thing and everything was going to have a computer, then you would download the upgrade to everything, to your doorbell, to your washing machine. And the, you know, the closer we get to the Internet of Things, the more everything is changing around you without your necessarily noticing. I don't know if you saw this week when uh, – uh, uh, Tesla removed the battery restriction on a bunch of cars uh, when when the hurricane was coming, mm-hmm. so that they could drive farther. Did you see that? I didn't see that. No. All right. So you bought you know the cheaper Tesla, and it has a shorter range, but it has a shorter range because it's electronically limited. So what what Tesla did is saying, all right, there are a bunch of people in an emergency area about to be. This is. Houston, about to be hit by a hurricane, why don't we give those people a break and extend the range of their cars? And they just did it Mm -hmm. from download the upgrade, right? So anyway, uh, 
Yeah, it's just a willingness to say, well, if this is true now, where does it lead us, and and not dismiss that as impossible. Which which is very logical. Um, you know, I know the human nature and everybody. You know, you, you think it's going to be the same for for some reason, but you know, logically, we all know things are going to ch- things are going to change. You know, just you know, sort of yeah. a natural uh, situation over the last you know twenty thousand years, probably. You know, exactly right. It's just more visible right now. But I g- I'll give you a concrete corporate example. When I when I took over the Center for Business innovation at Ernst & Young, this would be, uh, well, let's call this around 1998, the, the uh, firm, the consulting part of Ernst & Young said that the business they were in was design, build, operate. So that makes sense. You, make a, you, you think about what, uh, what kind of a software system or a management process you need, and you build it, and then you run it. Mm-hmm. But then you run it until it doesn't fit the world anymore, and you have to do it again. So it's this um, uh, belief in stability, even though you have to repeatedly redesign. And so we, uh, one of the things we were proud of um, was that we changed the firm's tagline from design, build, operate to create, connect, evolve. And the idea there was you make something, but it's not in isolation, if you connect it to all the things it interacts with, you know, if you're a business, your customers, your suppliers, your employees, your community, et cetera, then you're constantly getting signals to tell you how you need to change. And if you have built to change, then you'll evolve in response to those signals. So it's a, it's a worldview that believes in change and then kind of an information system and, a, and an organizational belief that allows you to change all the time. Well, what, so, what, yeah, go ahead. While we're at it, what's, what's happening now? I mean, let's, let's dive right into that. What's, what changes, you know, I mean, I was going to eventually get to it. I might as well get into it now. What changes are you seeing now in the world, like over the next two years, three years? Well, let me tell you, I can do the portfolio thing, then you can come back to that question. So you asked me how... I, uh, how I came to be in the portfolio lifestyle. And right. it, it was an evolution, honestly. It's, um, I'll, just, I'll just quickly say, you know, I did this management consulting. I founded a group uh, that, that saw this digital convergence. And then I got asked to run the Center for Business Innovation for Ernst & Young, which was a think tank. And uh, that anticipate and shape the future of business was our think tank's mission. Now, Chris, were you we always an A-plus student? I get the feeling that you were one of these kids in school that always got, like, A's. Am I correct uh, in that assumption? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. I was, I, I, you know, um, for better and for worse, I really didn't care that much what the schools thought of me. Um, I probably would have done, I mean, I, there are things I could have done if I'd, if I'd thought that their opinion mattered so much, but I just was one of those kids who did what he wanted to do. And I got A's in a bunch of things and I had my share of C's in college. And, uh, so all oh, over the map. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Just curious. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so what happened was, um, the, uh, you know, through, I talk about, uh, responding to outside uh, events. So basically, Ernst & Young sold our Center for Business Innovation to Capgemini, and Capgemini uh, is an IT services firm that just is kind of anti, uh, anti-innovation anti in its way. So they shut us down, and I realized that I had personal clients at that time that were happy to... Um, you know, keep paying me individually for what I've been doing for them. And so uh, getting effectively laid off actually didn't make that much difference to my life. Mm -hmm. And then uh, about two years went by, I went back and I I started a business based on one of my books. This was about human capital. This is like the late Um, 80s, late 80s, mid 80s time frame? No, we're now into, uh, we're now, no, we're in the 2000s. Oh, we're in the 2000s. Two, okay. 2004, I went to Monitor Group. Okay. And started something called Monitor Talent, which was kind of a uh, talent agency for thought leaders. Um, anyway, you know, t- and I and I kept those clients that I'd been serving, you know, th- at that point for 10 years. Um, and then, you know, when when Monitor had uh, its problems and my venture went away. Just uh, there, I, I just decided I'm going to live with my clients. I'm not going to look for uh, an institutional setting, 
And so I'm Nerve LLC, as you said, and I'm just, you know, uh, doing, it's a little like what I said about school. I'm doing the things I want to do. Some of them, some of them pay, some of them are pro bono and, uh, Mm -hmm. that's fine. And, you know, I just did a podcast and I had as my guests, Kevin Kelly, who was the, the editor of Wired, uh, founding editor of Wired, and Aaron Maniam, who's a, uh, in, in the Ministry of Industry in Singapore. And I asked them, do they work? This was about the future of work. And they both say, yeah, I work all the time. I only get paid for some of it, but everything I do is trying to create something I care about. Um, and that's kind of what it feels like. Well, that's like the ultimate thing, it seems. That's what you know, everyone you, you would think would aspire to, you know. Do what you want to do. Yeah, do and you know, once free, upon a time, that's mm-hmm. what he did, right? Before, there weren't always these, these large institutions that provided so much of, uh, of employment. Um, but, you know, it mattered a lot whether you were, uh, whether you were Scrooge or whether you were Marley, I suppose. Uh, okay, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, even though it's a small company, um, not Scrooge, no, Cratchit, I mean. Scrooge and Marley were the partners. Cratchit was the was the uh, clerk. Mm. But uh, anyway, um, so, yeah, so I just kind of evolved uh, into this, uh, this portfolio life. And I do think, um, I do think it's going to be more popular, both because the corporate job, as everybody's been talking about, just uh, there aren't there aren't as many of them. But what there are are not as enveloping. They're not as as oriented towards spending your whole career with a company. The, the, those kinds of jobs really are going to shrink. In whether whether you're talking about working for a big company or a, a government or not. Okay, so you really got to develop your skill sets. It sounds now like like big time with this competition. Yeah, I, I think so. And also, you're, yeah. I mean, you're, you're, um, I think your self reliance. You know, it's uh, um, in the industrial world. You know, the the thing. I mean, my generation inherited this whole history of the depression, right? where you have this explosion of industrial employment and then you get the depression and people are out of work and they really are, you know, in precarious situations. And so huge psychological trauma. And I think the society um, has, uh, for the last 50 years, has had that attitude. But then again, if you look at the people who are 20 and, well, I'll give you a story. Um, in 2002 is when Capgem and I shut down my innovation center. I had about 30 people. It was uh, it was December 23rd, by the way. Speaking of Scrooge, <laughs> oh, okay, was that the um, day that that the, or excuse me, a Christmas day? Okay. okay, yeah, okay. I guess maybe it was the 22nd. Okay, because um, I, I remember you know having the phone call where they kind of made it official and said. Um, you know, well, the people from HR and legal will come up tomorrow and we'll tell everybody their options. We'll sit with them. And um, uh, so, you know, I went and called my organization together and told them that. And the next day, everybody comes in and, you know, it's kind of somber. But one guy comes in in a Santa Claus suit and we <laughs> we're, we um, we we had some uh, some alcohol in that office, and we just made a day out of it. And after the, all the all the HR people left, we went out and we had kind of a wake for our organization. Mm. And there was there was not, with the exception of um, a couple of the older people who'd been there a long time, uh, who were really our our controller and accountant, the the researchers and the marketers, they. They just really were not discouraged in the least by being, you know, laid off and getting a decent severance and figuring out what they were going to do next. So two of them, two of these guys who had played basketball together as undergraduates, and they'd been uh, doing research for me, and they went to Belize and started, like, running a condo. So there is already, I think, a generation that doesn't think they depend individually as much on um, – on an institutional setting. Well, that's now, exciting. Fair, that's exciting to me. Yeah, well, it's a it's a huge change, and I think very much for the better. But 
I've got to acknowledge that I don't know what we're talking about here in terms of proportion of the population that's ready for this. I really mm-hmm. don't know. Mm-hmm. Right, um, right, right. Okay. Because all, you know, highly paid professional types, um, and that's not a huge proportion of the population. But nonetheless, I think that attitude of, uh, of independence, and this, you know, corporate managers for the last 15 years have been complaining about the independence of the millennials, and they do the work they want to do. Um, I think that ends up being a good thing because the the society is for the people, not for the corporations, or right. it's supposed to be. So where right. where are we going from here with all this? Okay, I know that's happening. This portfolio career thing seems to be you know emerging. Maybe it's going to be the way. Um, yeah. The general population probably has to catch up a little more than this than the higher professionals, you know, um, and figure it out. Um, so, but where is where's everything going in the next three years? Is, is it even possible yeah. to predict this? And I know it's not sure fire, but, you know, I'm, I'm yeah, not sure. sure I have an idea. Um, well, and, I, I will say just to mm-hmm. stick with the theme about work for a minute, um, mm-hmm. I think this uh, dichotomy between, I'm, you know, I have a real, a quote, good job and I'm a gig worker and and uh, precarious. I think those that that distinction is going to be reduced by a couple of things. I think you know this. The the uh, what California just did to pass a law that said you know your drivers Lyft and Uber your drivers are actually employees. I think that is the leading edge of um, establishing more security for people who are more self reliant, right? So I think uh, I think. There will be benefits. I think insurance companies, if they're smart, for example, will stop making it so different to be in a group. They'll make synthetic groups. Um, someday, and, and you know, I'm, I'm, my main frame of reference here is the United States, but in a European society, a lot of your benefits are provided, the same benefits, but they're not provided by a company. They're provided by the state, right? Mm-hmm. Why is that important? Uh, let's leave the leave the ideology out of it and just look at the economics. Portable benefits make you more self-reliant. You know, the number of people who say they won't change jobs because they're not sure they can get something with the same health care benefits. Right. That's an inhibition on the on the liquidity of our skills market. Right. Mm-hmm. You're mm-hmm. stuck in place right. for a reason that has nothing to do with your productivity. Well, that was the old Where thing I, when you got a job in the in the eighties. I remember my mother would say, well, "What are the benefits?" You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Right. And that's that is the mindset of you know, I work for the telephone. You know, it it <laughs> they take care of me. And I'll tell you, in when I started working with a foundation for innovation in Spain, this is fifteen years ago, they had done a survey of university students, and seventy percent of them. 70% of them wanted to go to work for the government. And it's not like the Spanish government was the Singapore government where, you know, the smartest people went there and they got paid more than anybody else. Spanish government was, you know, an okay bureaucracy like like U.S. or European governments, but they were perceived as a really secure job and therefore a high prestige job. And the reason we were talking about then is uh, that then is that it was an inhibition on the innovation in that society, and so uh, that's changed a lot in Spain because they went through you know quite a cycle, and now you see uh, biotech entrepreneurship and it's you know it's a different economy. But having a having a business fail there you know a, a venture fail used to be like you know having a child out of wedlock you were disgraced right. Mm-hmm. Um, now it's a little it's it's changed quite a lot. So, but anyway, this yeah yeah sorry right. go ahead. The, the word you well, use just, inhibition. I mean that's a pretty nasty word. I mean in, usually when things are inhibited, that's that's never good. Correct. I mean that's that seems well, like a pretty powerful um, word that you, that you use there. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think it's you know what creates a black market is the inhibition or the blockage of the tr- of the trade that wants to happen, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if people want, so let's talk about alienation from work. If you're doing work that you don't like anymore, but you're doing it because you're afraid to change jobs, 
what happens? So, um, I mean, it's it's obviously too big a leap to say opiates happen, but um, if you are not, as survey after survey shows in the United States, if you're not excited about your work, then you feel like you're wasting a bunch of time. So this idea of self-direction is um, is is a step, a big step toward people getting to do more of what they want to do. I mean, I'll tell you, um, the, the back to anticipate and shape, I used to say to people, I still say to people, all I want to do is have a chance to talk about interesting topics with smart people. And somehow I've made a portfolio where that's what I get to do. And obviously you got to do it in a way that's valuable enough to the people you're talking to that it's, uh, you get you get what you need in terms of, of economic compensation, but um, and equally obviously, not everybody wants to spend all their time talking about this futures kind of stuff. But they want to, you know, they want to do what they want to do, and the the inhibitions created by the industrial economy um, get in the way of that. So you ask what's happening, um, and slowly the we're going to look back in, I don't know, 25 years, even certainly 50, and say, you know, the industrial economy was the aberration. People used to work for themselves. They used to farm or they used to live over their blacksmith shop or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then we got technology and, you know, it created tons and tons and tons of value. I'm not knocking it at all. But in order to serve that technology, we built factories, we built three shift labor forces, right? We then created benefits associated with a company and, and we created a culture which really was a machine age culture where the, the labor, because it starts in the 1920s when, when half the labor can't read, the labor is treated as a cog in that machine. And so the, the, the really long-term thing that's happening is we're recovering from that to a more uh, human and social society. Okay. Wow. And in, in 50 years from now, we'll, what will we look back to these years as? What do you think the, the, the feeling will be then? I mean, I'm going out yeah. a while here, but I'd like to ask you the question, you know. Yeah, well, <laughs> forecasts are, for, are only for podcasts, right? Yeah. Um, we'll put a disclaimer I, on. Yeah. yeah. Well, I do think, you know, the, this longevity thing, I don't know that people are going to live forever, but one, so I, I said one of the things that's going on is, is a dim, diminution of this inhibition to change your, your economic setting. Another thing that's going on is life expectancy is just going to continue to grow and that's going to create uh, challenges that I have no clue about in terms of more generations being alive at the same time. So, I don't know what the um, – there, there are two things that I don't think are known. One is, let's say, Ray, you're going to live to 125. What I don't think people know is how much cognitive deterioration is going to go along with that physical longevity. Well, you uh, said 125. I, I got you know. I, I I'm afraid to think what what I would even look like at that age. You know, and even yeah. sound like <laughs> can I even get out of bed? You know. Uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, no, it's a, uh, it, it's interesting. I have a in November. I'm running a uh, a colloquium on what's new in neuroscience. And um, to be honest, what I'm getting out of the research and conversations leading up to that is, you know. All, we we aren't close on neurodegenerative diseases. We've been working this one hypothesis that people, you know, probably know about the the plaques, um, but it's not clear. People who don't have any cognitive degeneration have the plaques too. So, you know, we we aren't close to figuring that out. So, if physical longevity grows, but that means more and more dependent people. Uh, this is hardly a new idea with me, but that's a big social change. Mm. How many people are, you know, uh, are, are going to be supported? And, and, and uh, so Japan is an interesting place to look at this because the Japanese live long lives. They're, um, 
uh, and they're not replacing their population. So they are the pathfinder in what happens when you have a population getting steadily older on average. And it's also unusual because Japan tends to uh, restrict immigration. So they're not importing labor to take care of people. And the result of that is Japan is the world's leader in developing robots that take care of people. Hmm. And when I say take care of people, they're not just bringing them their food, they're playing with them. So there's a robot called Paro, P-A-R-O, that's kind of like a fur seal, and it's furry, and you can hold it in your lap, and you pet it, and it purrs, and stuff like that. And their research says that a half an hour with Paro does more for a mid-stage um, uh, mid -stage dementia patient than an hour of music therapy. You know, that was a specific. So it's study. like having a pet, like a, like a, yeah. a robot pet, right? Yeah, exactly. So, you Makes know, uh, yeah. so anyway, that's yeah. another another trend that's mm. inexorable that's going to cause big dislocation. But I suppose good news is you're going to get to meet your great great grandchildren someday. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, you go down a few on the greats now. My great 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 grandchildren yeah. <laughs> uh, next door, you know. But uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> let, let me pivot. We got a couple other nice topics here. I, I want to get them in. The um, we, yeah. were, we were talking um, the other day about the, the uh, I guess putting a value on government and uh, the services uh, or talk about yeah. that because that's really interesting to me. Yeah, sure. Um, well, this started, uh, as it happens, I was in, um, Saudi Arabia and I noticed that, um, on television, there's a closed circuit channel that shows you 24 seven, just has a camera on the Kaaba, the, the, uh, you know, the big black building that people on the Hajj on the pilgrimage come to see. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is not exactly, you know, entertaining. <laughs> yeah. uh, but on the other hand, what is the role of the Saudi government? The Saudis are, you know, they are the shrine for that holy place. And they're showing their population that they're doing their work, right? Mm -hmm. That okay. the shrine, that the pilgrimage is happening, that the shrine is, you know, is there. And, um, and I was talking to another person who was there with me who was Danish about what governments do for their people. And, of course, Denmark is one of the leaders in um, so-called flex security, flexible security that they provide to their citizens. And he, he made a statement that I just couldn't stop thinking about, which is if you're going to give half your money to your government, you really need to trust they're going to do something good with it. Yep. Right. Okay. Sure. I yep. thought, mm -hmm. how would we know? Right. They're the Saudis, at least making visible one thing they're doing. Right. Now, I'm not saying the Saudi government is the most responsive to its people's needs. But I thought, how do we know if our government is doing a good job? Right. And I spent some time thinking about this. And as I was trained as an economist, and we measure value at the national level through something called the National Income and Product Accounts, NEPA. And so when you see a GDP statistic, that's been figured out by this NEPA system. And if you look at that system, government, the contribution of government to national income is measured by its cost. So that's as if uh, say, the value of having the rule of law in, in uh, your society was equal to the cost of the police forces and the courts and the prisons. Um, and I think we think it's more valuable than that, or that, you know, uh, certified drugs and safe drinking water, uh, the value of that is equal to the cost of the FDA. So, those are two examples, or safe skies, the FAA, right? Those, those are two examples where huge value is created by government, but not counted anywhere as output, as GDP. Right, what does cost mean? I mean, cost, the thing could be inflated a million times, you know. Well, 
It could be, but I mean, uh, it's it's measurable. It's the people. I mean, you know, if you're talking about the FDA, you can you can count the people who work there, and and uh, we have systems for measuring that. Oh, okay. But, so the people getting the money is where where the cause is. So it's creating the the jobs yeah. for them. Okay. Okay. And the jobs, the office buildings, the you know, the, all that. Okay. The okay. Copying paper, all of that. Okay. But but when we measure the output of, um, you know. Uh, of Apple, it's their final sales price, right? That includes a lot of profit, and the profit is somehow related to the value added. That's the key, okay. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so the implication of this accounting is government adds no value. And if you believe it adds no value, then, you know, what are you paying for? You're paying, you think you're paying just for a bunch of bureaucrats and not for your clean water, not for your good drugs, not for your law and order. And so if you had statistics that say, here's the value government added, then we could compare the Danish government and the U.S. government and the Saudi government and say, how good are they at adding value for their citizens? Right. You know, the poor government. Um, we could say... Uh, well, this is what your taxes are buying. Is that too expensive? Is it a bargain? But we don't know because we can't have that conversation. And in the absence of that information, you get uh, ideological um, discussions about, you know, as Ronald Reagan says, the government knows, you know how to spend your money better than the government knows. Well, that's not always true. Uh, but it's it's maybe it's true sometimes, and maybe there are things that government shouldn't be doing that it is doing, but vice versa as well. So I think this is a subtle thing, which is a it's an open feedback loop that needs to be closed. And if it were closed, our political process would do a better job of creating the public goods that the world that that would make our society better. Now, so, now they, the government, I would think, wouldn't want that to happen. Then there's more accountability and all that stuff. I mean, is that a pretty logical assumption, I'll call it, that, you know, they, well, they probably wouldn't want that to happen. Well, it on, on uh, who you talk to in the government, right? I mean, you, you see this actually happening uh, with NGOs, mm-hmm. right? So there's a convergence. One of the things I do pro bono is work with a group called the Fourth Sector Group, Um uh, which is a, an organization I helped to found. And the idea there is that we usually think about having three sectors in the economy, the private sector, you know, businesses, the public sector, governments, and the nonprofit sector, NGOs. Um, what's happening, let's leave government out of this for a minute, is that the, uh, the NGOs and the, and the businesses are converging in the following way. Businesses are getting held more accountable for their so-called externalities, right? Their pollution or their, um, if they're not paying a living wage. So if you're working, you know, you're working at Walmart, you also have to work at McDonald's and you're, and therefore Walmart is increasing our income inequalities. That's a negative externality that, that falls on that Walmart's way of doing business causes negative things to happen to some of their employees. So, uh, and of course, pollution is the classical negative externality that, uh, you know, your air is worse and you can do nothing about it because a steel mill is upwind of you. So corporations, the business sector, is increasingly moving toward a position of accountability for those costs to the society. And I don't know if you saw the uh, business roundtable, I guess it's a month ago now, issued a statement, the business roundtable now, this is not, you know, a political act. Uh, Well, it is partly, but anyway, that they are accountable for their impact on all their stakeholders, their employees, their community, their customers, their suppliers, as well as their shareholders. So, So part one of this convergence is business is becoming more accountable for all of its impact, not just its economic impact. Now you look at NGOs and people who are giving money to various philanthropies want to see their so-called theory of change and they want measures of it. They want to see 
that you're not just running this uh, this organization, which is eating up 80% of the donations, running itself. They want to see results. So there's a wonderful organization called 100K in 10. And that uh, the Obama administration set a goal of getting 100,000 uh, talented STEM teachers into our schools in 10 years. And the people who run 100K in 10 are so rigorous about setting their goals, measuring their progress toward them, and making sure that they're really going to achieve that goal in 10 years. It's, it's, uh, you, you would, you would, end, as a business, you would envy what a great job they've done of that. Um, and so the, the nonprofit sector is moving toward accountability for its mission, um, just the way we like to think businesses are. So I don't see any reason that government shouldn't move in that same direction, which is not to say that, you know, to your point, there, there's certainly going to be some resistance to that. But it seems to me that if we're going to have a competitive country, we have to do that. And I don't think there's anyone in the Singapore government, which is now, you know, the world's richest country in terms of purchasing power per capita, um, uh, we're going to hold people accountable for that value created in government as well. Now, Chris, just on a simple level, um, you know, in my town, yeah. pay taxes for the school system, say the police. How do, how do we know that that money is, is, you know, is not going to any, any waste, you know, bureau, bureaucrats, extra people work in the police. Maybe we got 25 police officers. We only need four. There's no real crime in my town. And, you know, the teachers are they you know, are they doing a good job? There, there really is no way to measure all that then, is there? You got it. Huh. Okay. We don't. Okay. We don't. Okay. And I, you know, <laughs> so, so there are a number of, approaches you could take to this problem. You know, as an economist, I think, well, we need to develop this new measurement system and get it deployed and get it rigorous and make it part of how the government measures itself. I talked to Seth Godin, you know, who is, who is really a marketer at heart, and he's all about changing individual behavior. He said, don't do it that way. He said, start a contest among librarians in towns and have, get some librarians together, get them to say what value they add, and then deploy a measurement system and, a, and have a prize, you know, for the best librarian of the, of the year and get them competing, and then go on to the next, you know, go on to the police forces, et cetera. And uh, there actually is, there is an organization that does some measurement of police forces now, because I know that because I heard a podcast about it. I can't, I can't tell you more about it, but I think... I think Seth is right that if we start doing this, we'd start it by measuring local services and having some pride, having them take pride in their productivity and having, you know, we can be proud in our town of having, you know, well, when I lived in Lexington, Massachusetts, the fact that our public school, uh, public high schools produced perennial um, math Olympics winners, that was a source of pride to the town. So, um, uh, yeah, so I think it could, I think it could happen that way. How, how do you think it? You know, in your own gut feel, Chris, from say one to ten, how do you how do you think the value is? Is is, is it? I know it's not a ten, with ten being the highest. Like, can you? Yeah. Like, what would your guess be? Like, the, the value that we're really getting for all these government services that we're putting in into? I don't think you can give a, a national answer. I think it's very local. You know, I think. Um, uh, so it have to be a local thing, depending upon okay. who you are. We were talking, uh, my wife saw yesterday some statistics about homelessness in different U.S. cities. And, you know, you hear a tremendous amount about how San Francisco, you know, you can't walk down the street without seeing a lot of homeless people. And it's a real problem. Um, you do not have that perception of Boston. Um, and what was a surprise to her was Boston has approximately the same number of homeless people as San Francisco. And mm -hmm. she said, well, maybe I can say something good about Boston here because we seem to be handling this problem in a more sensitive way. Um, so that's what I mean by I don't think you can do it nationally. OK, OK. How, what, would, what rank would you give a Boston? That's a good question. You know, I, I'd be irresponsible. I know you want an answer. But <laughs> I, it's, it's not like, I mean, I feel quality of life in Boston is, is superb, but I don't know that, I don't know that that 
Uh, I don't know how much the government should get credit for that, some, but, you know, you have these universities and hospitals that attract a lot of money from abroad and smart people from all over the world, and they, in turn, um, make for a pretty good economy and a sophisticated economy and a world with a lot of culture and intellectual stuff going on. So all that makes me feel good about Boston. Right. But right. I don't know how the average person really feels about it. Okay. Okay. Better than not as well as some, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. What about Chris of someone that says, and we hear people say it, hey, the stock market is the highest ever. I'm doing great. We're doing great. What do you think of that theory? Yeah, we can measure. Look at how the stock market is. The economy is booming. You know, all that, all those things that come in. Yeah. You know, crimes down or whatever. All that does that count for anything? Well, there there are two questions you have to ask. One is, you know, the stock market has, as whoever it was, J.P. Morgan once said, markets will fluctuate, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the the stock market is. Uh, you know, a very local indica indicator in terms of time. And you remember the phrase animal spirits? I think that was Helen Greenspan. Mm -hmm, right. Um, there are all kinds of things that drive the stock market. And what you really want to look at there is long-term holding periods and how they're really doing. Because, you know, if you looked four years ago, you'd get one picture. You look four years from now, you get another. Um, the economy... I mean, I'd, I'd a lot rather look at employment and unemployment being way down. That's a that's a real thing, but there aren't so many people looking for jobs who can't find them. And certainly, the General Motors strike is a uh, is a sign of robustness in uh, demand for labor, and that's really important because it was a long time coming. And automation continues to drive down the demand for certain kinds of labor, and will continue to. And we're going to have to figure that out, uh, and we can we can talk about you know universal basic income and those ideas in a second. But first, I want to come back to your you know your booming market and and booming economy. the The challenge, the problem we have, is that labor's share of national income is much lower than it was in say the 1980s, and um, so the question is booming for whom? And I probably, you probably know, and I bet your listeners know that we have had this concentration of income. I mean, the, the sort of the code phrase for that is the one percent or the tenth of one percent. Where, and I don't know the inflammatory statistics about you know ten thousand people have more wealth than, or a thousand people have more wealth than the bottom half of the of the uh, of the distribution. But we have, uh, starting with the deregulation of the 80s, if you look at the macro statistics, the proportion of income going to labor, national income, has been steadily falling. Mm -hmm. And that, that leads, I mean, that's the converse of concentration of wealth among people who have capital. And... Um, you know, we in the, the United States is moving into the territory of, um, you know, what we used to call banana republics, where a few rich families control the whole country. And I think that just has to stop. You know, uh, Nixon had an economic advisor named Herbert Stein, who had this um, amusing yet profound statement, which is, if something cannot go on forever, it will stop. So that's a tautology. But the fact is, if in, you can't keep increasing income concentration until one person gets it all, right? So it's got to stop. And uh, so you go back to Occupy Wall Street and you say, what what was on their mind? And their, what was on their mind is the booming economy, isn't the, the, the benefits aren't being sufficiently shared. So now let's talk about productivity, because people will say, well, sure, it's fair because we can't find the uh, increased productivity. So uh, that means if you want a higher share of, um, of income to go to labor, now you're doing redistribution. And for some, that's really a no-no. Um, to me, 
the point is not that kind of fairness. It's having a fair society. And uh, there's a book called Viking Economics, which made a stark statement that I had never thought about. It said the United States society is built on insecurity. You know, that if you if you lose your job, it's not clear how you get fed in the society, whereas it is in Denmark. And what is the, you know, what is the impact of that in terms of how people feel about life, and what's the impact of that in terms of crime statistics, drug addiction statistics, um, proportion of the society incarcerated, and I hope a, a reader or a listener or two will pick up a book called The Spirit Level, which collects those uh, statistics by nation. And it shows that all of these expensive social problems that we spend money trying to fix, like crime, are correlated with the degree of income inequality. So I think to have a society uh, where people get to respect themselves, we have to have a little more secure society. And that needs to come from a lower concentration of income and wealth. So the boom has to be shared. So there's a second boom coming, and that is based um, on this productivity boom that, that um, you know, I information technology is continuing to create. And we're not very good at measuring it, but it is there. And, you know, we, we don't measure how much time you save when you shop online. Um, in any accurate way. And we don't measure how much easier life is because you can get a lot of things delivered without paying very much for it. Um, actually, that's looked at as negative growth because we reduce the number of miles driven and gasoline spent and cars used up and stuff like that. So we, I, I believe the people who say we're going to have a continuing technological boom due to the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence and better communications uh, and better sensors, all of that is going to be great. Um, it's important that it not that the benefits of that productivity get shared in a way that creates a fair society. Are you optimistic, Chris, that that will happen or what's your, what's your feeling on that? The way yeah, we're you know, mm -hmm. I I kind of am, but I <laughs> I can see the other side. I tend to be an optimist, but I think so. I think back to Herbert Stein. I don't think we can go further in this direction of, um, you know, a few companies, honestly, uh, controlling the way life is, and also what's called regulatory capture, and having such a deep influence on government policy. So let me give you an analogy from uh, the Industrial Revolution. You know, we, we uh, in, the, in the first part of the 20th century, we invent this great stuff. We have steel mills. We have automobiles. We have affordable automobiles. Um, we have railroads, so we get national markets for things. So we can have big companies because they're serving the nation. And what happens? So what happens is, number one, these companies have a lot of – they are providing the jobs, so they have a lot of power over labor. They create three shifts. They basically abuse labor, and there's a famous case where at one of Carnegie's steel mills, uh, the Pinkerton guards fire guns at people who are picketing outside. Ooh, okay. Yeah, and, the, and that triggered – an outrage, and eventually we got labor laws, and you know we protected unionization. We got a we got a fairer balance of power between labor and capital. Um, similarly, I mentioned you know you had railroads, you had national markets, these these you know uh, consumer companies um, get to be um, get to be monopolistic. Right. They get they get enough market power that they can charge what they want and not innovate and, you know, not be good for the economy. And then eventually that abuse begets antitrust laws. So in the 20s, we break up, you know, Standard Oil and U.S. Steel and a bunch of companies that were uh, exerting too much monopoly power, market power. Um, and the third would be uh, finance and we had, again, concentration of wealth and financiers controlling a lot of policy. We should have, and taking a lot of risk, 
And we didn't do much until we got the crash and then we got financial regulation. So since the 80s, well, well, so the conclusion of that is when the society gets out of balance, it finds ways to fix it. That's the history. Mm -hmm. So I kind of feel like we're at that moment where we're searching for the way we've had since the 80s, since the deregulation of all the things I just mentioned, right? Labor is weaker. Regulators of all sorts are weaker. Antitrust is um, has been kind of helpless. Um, it's time that we figure out the next turn of the wheel and how to recover regulatory uh, oversight and uh, a fairer distribution of income and wealth. I'm optimistic about it because I just think it has to happen, even mm -hmm. though I could give you a plausible scenario for how. Okay. Based on the past history of how it always seems to have, ha have happened, that we yeah. progress, that, you know, yeah. it's, it's most likely going to happen again. Yeah. Because otherwise you have to have, I mean, otherwise you have the conditions for a revolution, and I don't really believe that's going to happen. Right, so right. if it can't go on forever, it will stop. The question is, how is it going to stop? Let's rule out some kind of, you know, French Revolution um, and say, what is it going to take to get a political consensus that we need a fairer society? And I, I kind of feel that's been growing. And this alarm that we're going to displace all the jobs with automation, I think that that feeds the desire to have a better solution than that. Ah, okay. And it, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think artificial intelligence, Chris, what do you think about that? Just give me two minutes, and I'm going to talk about some of your traveling after that, and then we'll do our, our word association. What do you, what's your opinion right. on artificial intelligence? Um, you know, there's a, there's, a, uh, there's a longer history about it than a lot of people know. I remember in, like, 1993 went out and had dinner with an artificial intelligence entrepreneur in, in uh, Palo Alto. And he showed me, I don't know, I think that's the days of like Palm Pilots or something. I mean, <laughs> but he had a little device in his pocket. And on it, the, he was showing off his, his expert system was the buzzword. And so he, and whatever food I'd ordered, and it, it said, what wine should you have? Um, and that was artificial intelligence circa 1993. And then there was something called the AI winter because people, you know, people invested in AI companies and not much came out of it. Um, and so then it got to be, it got to have a bad name. And people, people who were still working on AI said, you know, once it works, we don't call it AI because then we can't get it, get any investment, but it's, it's growing. And then we got this thing. Uh, you know, um, called machine learning. And that was very important to accelerating uh, the advance of AI. So I think AI is going to be tremendously important and it's not very well understood by most people. They think it's, you know, uh, they think it's just this system that say, here's a real case. Um, a researcher at a, at a hospital took 1,600 cases of diabetes, the data on 1,600 cases, and gave it to a machine learning piece of software. And, you know, we think of type 1 and type 2 diabetes. The, the, uh, the software said, no, there are actually six different diseases here. So that's a wonderful thing. You know, you, you, um, it prompts a whole set of new research that's going to make people healthier. So that kind of application is, is, is going to grow for sure. Um, and it's going to be very positive. Um, okay. okay. There's a second thing that's happening, which most people wouldn't call artificial intelligence, but uh, because it doesn't involve machine learning or face recognition or one of those things. But think about, um, uh, well, every time when, when we have serious power failures, and they don't happen so much anymore, but it's because if I go back to like the Northeast power blackout or the, the, um, can't remember the one in New York, what year it was, but anyway, these things, these things happen because we 
we in the past have not been able to sense that there was an overload somewhere and that that overload was going to propagate. And when it propagated, it was going to keep shutting down one thing after the other because people couldn't keep up with the system. So now imagine we have sensors everywhere and the sensors are attached to not terribly smart software, but just smart enough to know what an overload is and what to do about it. Um, and that every piece of switchgear in the electrical power grid has that. Then you have um, an intelligent network that's smart enough to protect itself. Now, that wouldn't be called AI, but all the things that we're building so that, you know, you get a notice that your package has been delayed and nobody had to, nobody had to pay attention. That was just done by a sensor mm -hmm. and a whole system. So the world is getting smarter in the sense of more aware, more conscious of its own state, more able to communicate and take action based on changes in that state than it has ever been. And to me, that's, that's just as important as the, you know, the AI and the robot that, that we might see in a sci-fi movie. Um, the world is certainly getting more intelligent and more productive as a result. And that's where a lot of these jobs start disappearing because nobody has to, Nobody has to write that email. Nobody has to note the um, note the delay. Nobody has to be in a control room shutting down a circuit breaker. Um, right, right, right. And uh, those those things are real. Well, it's like my wife orders Amazon, and it's like you know, like the, that night, and then the next morning is there. She, oh yes, it'll be here by eleven. You know, we get the notification. It's like boom, and like you know, it still boggles my mind how that happens. You know, it's like I know it. Yeah. I know, I'm yeah. saying. Which is, I'm great. It's great it's happening, you know, but it's... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you know. interesting point lately, and maybe you want to stick this back in the next two years thing, but uh, there, was a, there was a great article in The Economist about the supply chain and what's happening there. And it was saying, you know, forget the trade wars. Supply, you know, globalization has been slowing down because costs are equalizing, because, say, labor in China is getting expensive compared to how it used to be when people went to China to get cheap manufacturing. And also, people value speed even more than cost. So the fact that you're remarking on, you know, ordered last night here today, you can't do that if it's coming from China. Um, and so supply chains are getting geographically shorter. And... Uh, and that just leads to more and more of what we're just talking about, uh, intelligence to pre-position inventory and intelligence to dispatch deliveries and all of that. Right. Um, world just working in this, in this, I mean, this, and this is part of what prevents revolution, right? Is the world actually works better than it used to. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Chris, I'm going to, a little fun. I'm going to, I'm going to get into my hit and miss. I, I'll put a travel question in here because uh, it's my word association. All right. All right you're you're ready, yeah. to, ready to go on this? Uh, I, All I, right. I can do word salad at the drop of a hat. All right. All right. <laughs> what is your favorite color? Blue. Blue? Blue. Okay. I think that's what most, I think that's the majority, but I wear a lot of blue. Okay. And I like blue. Yeah. Good. If you were in a foxhole, other than any family members, who would be in the foxhole with you? Well, you know, my first answer to that is, is always Kevin Kelly. I always say if I'm stumped and I have a dime to drop on a phone call, Kevin Kelly will reframe the problem for me. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. okay. So that's an intellectual answer. Then there's, you know, you could have other criteria like, if it's a foxhole, you need a warrior, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'd go for Wonder Woman, I think. Okay, that, sound, that sounds good. That's the first Wonder Woman I got on that one. I like that one. Uh-huh. Yeah. If you were on a deserted island and five years, beautiful weather, two musical CDs you could bring, which two music CDs would you bring with you? Quadrophenia mm -hmm. by The Who. Uh, and some... I guess I guess some collection of Bach organ music. Okay, okay, okay. Favorite movie? Ah, uh, the movie I've seen the most often is 2001: Space Odyssey. Okay, is that your favorite? Uh, I. 
I'm a big fan of a deer hunter. Okay, okay. That's that's on a lot here at night, it seems. It's like, like an 11 o'clock movie. It's a great night one. Is that watch. right? Yeah, I don't know why. It's, it's on a lot. Yeah. Um, right. Favorite actor? God, these are tough. These are tough. These are tough. These are hard. Who? George Clooney. Wow, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd be surprised. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was in that one in Massachusetts, right, with the uh, the perfect storm. That was he was great in that one. That was Yeah. Yeah, he was cool. Yeah. Ocean. Favorite ocean? Pacific. I well no, Mediterranean. Mediterranean. Is that an ocean? I think so. Yeah. Well it's the first thing that comes to your mind, so it doesn't really matter. But that's what you yeah, said. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Top five rock groups. Who are your top five rock groups of all time? All right, so who is number one? Okay. Um, Everly Brothers. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is like the John Cusack question, right? From, um, uh, does, he, uh, does he ask that? I'm, I'm not sure. Oh, he's all, it's in, in um, not Local Hero. It's another movie. He's, oh, he's okay. always asking for top, top ten list. Oh, yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's one of my things, yeah, yeah. too, yeah. Uh, I don't know if Mose Allison qualifies for rock. Probably not as jazz. Um, well, I mean, if, if you go three, that's fine. You know, I mean, right? Who Everly Brothers, Mose Allison, and you know, uh, a little embarrassed, but I listen to an awful lot of Paul Simon. Okay, well, wow, he's great. He's great. He was on last night. We were, you know, he sounds like America. Remember the group America in the 70s? It's like that kind of similar type of sound, it seems. I just Yeah. Well, he, he has reinvented himself so many times. You know, he's done the South African music. He's done the Zydeco music. Uh, he's done a lot of stuff. So, okay. Um, yeah. Good, good. Biggest life lesson you ever learned? Actually, I'll th- I'm going to throw Bette Midler in there to get to five. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Bette. I haven't heard of her in a while. Yeah. Okay. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, I'm old, you know, what can I do? <laughs> she had a great voice, you know? Yeah. No doubt about it. What's your biggest life lesson? Whoa. I get, um, I get heavy There's always another show. train. There's always another train. Ah, I like I mean, that. You miss the train, there's always another one. Okay. So you know, okay. You have, this, you have some objective, you're killing yourself to make it, you don't make it, there's always another one. Don't get don't get, don't freak out if you miss that because there's always another one coming after it. You got it. I like it. Most famous person in the world you ever met? Oh boy, uh, Deng Xiaoping. Okay. Or the Dalai Lama. All right. How was the Dalai Lama? You just got to tell me that. He was uh, self-contained. He was friendly. Mm-hmm. Did, <laughs> did you get a? You know, did, did you get a great feeling just being around him? Any of that? A little bit, not a lot. wasn't wasn't transformative. I'll tell you where I got a. All right, so here, actually, you know, the most famous person I ever met is Judy Garland. Oh, holy smokes! <laughs> See, wow. Please tell, if, if, give me just Garland. a two minute Reader's Digest version on meeting her because she's one of my, you know, over the rainbow and the Wizard of Oz. That she's one of my favorites of all time. Yeah, yeah. Well. Um, my brother, who's a lot older than I am, was her next to last boyfriend in her life. Wait, wait, and, wait who uh, was this? Who was this? Then I got one more question after this. But who, who was this, Chris? Your, your friend was her? Say that again. My, my older brother was Judy Garland's uh, boyfriend for, wow. for okay. nine months or something. Okay. And so she had an apartment in Boston. And when I was in college, uh, I said, hey, we're in, we're in Boston. Why don't I have dinner? And we went to a poorly lit Polynesian restaurant in the, you know, halfway underground in the Somerset Hotel. And it was amazing. I have to say, it's, it, you know, you talk about feeling an aura, not with the Dalai Lama, but for sure with Judy Garland. It was like, if you saw The Natural, there's that scene where Glenn Close is in the stands and she's the only person you can right. see because of the way they right. light her. Yep. It was like this light was shining on really? her. She's she had... telling stories about, you know, about Toto and about Mickey Rooney and stuff. And people are coming over because even though you know, it was late in her life and she wasn't looking so good, um, but she was electric. And uh, people came over and got her autograph and told her how great she was. And it was an experience. 
Was it a vulnerability of some kind? I always thought she gave that off. That some kind of yeah. I mean, okay. let's call it let's call it neediness. But she was. I mean, she was there to perform for you. Hmm. Wow. So, you know, yeah. whoever you were, you came up and say Judy, and she was on for you. Wow. Okay. Okay. Well, you said when when you heard she passed away, it must have had a profound oh, yeah. effect since you met her. Yeah. 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 Sure. Okay. Chris, last one. You ready for this one? My last hit and miss here. Oh, well, you're asking some tough ones. Well, I, I, actually, I forgot my travel. Just give me the two best uh, places in the world, the two best cities in the world you've been to. I know you travel a lot on business and so forth. What, what are two like cities that stand out? I love Istanbul. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, Rome is really hard to beat. It's a cliche answer, but um, yeah. Rome and um, Istanbul. Is there another one? Sure. Um, Ravello on the Amalfi Coast. Oh, okay. A little town. Just okay. like, like, yeah. What's so good about that one? I haven't heard of that place before. Yeah. Um, the, the, it's, it's up on a, on a cliff, kind of, so the view over the, over the Mediterranean down the coastline is unbelievable. And it's just a little town with a big square, and the square is so friendly. You just could walk out there and sit down and never think about anything. Wow, wow. It's amazing how great some places are, isn't it, in the world? You just ah, almost, it's almost, you can't even put in words, right? That's a treat, yeah. Yeah. Okay, my last hit and miss. Here we go. Yeah. If you have, Chris, if you have one wish, I'm a genie. I'm going to grant this wish that's going to come true tomorrow. What would that wish be for you? God, it Take sounds, your time. Um, yeah, no, but it sounds that that people would be larger, that they would take a broader view. They'd be less, you know, they they would be more um, less driven by immediate self interest and a little more aware of the world around them. Mm. That would make if everybody did that. That would make for one heck of a world, I would think. That's that's why I pick it. You know the the um, if you want to change the world, you have to find something with leverage. This you can't you can't change one. I mean, changing one school is a good thing, but changing what we think education means is a big thing. So if we if we understand that generosity of, of of a kind you know ge- personal generosity is a value of our society and that um excessive self-interest is not tolerated in our society then we'll all be living in a place we like mm. wow that was yeah thank you for that that was uh yeah yeah and that, that would change everything it's just that simple yeah. thing you just said would, yeah yeah yeah. Chris, anything else you'd like to add? I mean, we covered a lot of stuff. You know, it could probably go on no, for 20 yeah, hours. With you, but, I, I, you know. I've never said what I just said to you before, and I appreciate your eliciting it. It's been great. Oh, okay, great. Um, any any website or anything anything coming up? I know you had a, have a book next year. Anything you want to? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. so my website is just ChristopherMeyer.com. But I think uh, right now um, – I just finished recording a podcast for my clients at Ernst & Young. I, I advise a group called EYQ, which is their think tank. And we put out a podcast called What's After, What's Next? So you can get it on Apple and everywhere else You know, podcasts are given away. And uh, it's part of EY's Better Question series. But if you look for What's After, What's Next, you'll find the trailer and they're going to be seven episodes of that and maybe another season next year oh okay so i'd love it if, uh, if your listeners gave that a listen yeah absolutely well i know i will so description alike all of those things yeah great chris thanks for coming out appreciate it and uh when one one day i like to have you on again because there's other things i like to cover if you'd be generous to come on again in, you know these next six months or whatever you know and, uh, sure yeah happy to do it right good that was chris meyer i am ray k we'll catch you next time